Friends, it's good to remember, isn't it, on this day, those that gave their lives for us, and as Bill has prayed this morning, we very much remember the sacrifice that they made. We, 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 we tend to remember them about once a year, don't we? Sometimes a little bit more in certain other occasions. We also remember, of course, the great sacrifice that our Lord made on Calvary once and for all for countless billions over 2,000 years and before and, and one way and another. And just thinking of those young men, mainly young men, who gave their lives, the, there, is a, there is a saying said by some veterans that there are no atheists in the trenches. And when you think of that expression, you tend to think, well, I wonder how many of those guys whose feelings we can never know must have been feeling when they were about to go into battle thinking, well, is this it for me? And how many will have turned to God thinking, well, there is no other way just at the time. We just don't know, do we? But I'd like to think that an awful lot came to the Lord in salvation just at that particular moment because for all they knew, all other options had pretty much gone. Let's just... Uh, remember them as we think that I think a fair number will have turned around and said Lord or God if you exist please be with me we need sometimes to be in a situation where we don't always see any control over what happens at all to bring us to the truth and one of the uh, one of the things I'd like to talk about this morning well, I say that one of the things the main thing really is our salvation Bill's already touched on it of course and we are promised it and all the rest of it, but how can we know that it is true? How can we know that it is true? I'm looking at a bunch of people this morning, um, the majority of whom, and probably all of whom, know the Lord Jesus and are sure of their salvation. But for anyone who's listening to this on the internet, this is just for you and you alone, these next few sentences. You need to come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a personal way. And when you do that, and if you don't know them at the, him at the moment, it's a separate sermon some other time, at some other place, maybe with some other person. If you don't actually know that at the moment, that is the main message for you. Because when you do know, as the majority, if not all of those here this morning do know, you can be absolutely sure that you have eternal life. So sometimes we can doubt it though, can't we? We can sometimes think, well, can I be sure of this? We may be like the lady who was converted along with her young son. They'd heard a message on John 5, verse 24, which says, Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. But in the, in the morning, the following day, the feeling was all gone, and mother was having the same old doubts, and she says, Well, son, the feeling is gone. So the boy ran, got his Bible, found John 5, 24, showed it to his mother and said, Mother, it's still there. It's still in the Bible, it hasn't gone away. You're okay. How can we be sure? How can we have the confidence of knowing that God's salvation is for us? Despite any lingering doubt that is, how can we banish all our fears and doubts altogether? True story, and it's happening right now apparently, that in Chicago in America... Dozens of people line up outside temporary service agencies in, in this city and they're lined up at 6 o'clock every morning looking for a job. But these agencies won't find jobs for them. They'll only find work for them to do for just one day. By 7 o'clock, over 100 of the people will be hired, as it were, at this agency. Eight hours later, another 100 will be hired for the next shift. Eight hours after that, the pattern is repeated again and again. And these are just a few hundred at this particular temporary services agency who are amongst the 30,000 in Chicago are hired each day, but only for one day's work. And they're part of the sort of local workforce that helps the economy. They make meals for airlines flying out of the international airport. They stuff envelopes for marketing firms. They do all sorts of things, really. They count inventory at warehouses, package orders for shipment, for internet retailers, they do light manufacturing, so on and so forth, but just for one day. And they're assigned an employer and they agree on a wage, I think it's something like $7 or something, which is the minimum wage over there. 
and then they're responsible for getting themselves to the workplace, and at the end of the day, they receive their pay, maybe 50 or 60 dollars or something, and they don't know if there's going to be any work for them tomorrow, but at least for that day, they know that they might be able to, or should be able to, to sustain their families for one more night. And when we look at the parable this morning that Jeff has read, we see a very similar pattern in the first century. Same situation in many ways as what there is in 21st century Chicago. The same group of workers are lining up first thing in the morning looking for work for the day. And this time it's the marketplace rather than the temporary service agency. This time it's the vineyard owner doing the hiring. And this time they've agreed on a wage for a one denarius for the day's work, a typical day's wage for manual labour apparently at the time. There is some disagreement actually amongst biblical scholars as to how much a denarius is worth. And I must admit I hadn't got a clue either until a couple of weeks ago I looked at it. And it is, apparently it's something like about £60 or thereabouts. Anyway, we'll take that as the example. Nothing extravagant, but a decent enough wage that can support a family. So in the parable, the Workers are invited by the vineyard owner to go into the vineyard to work, and yeah, it's fairly hard work, but work done with the knowledge that 60 quid was waiting for them at the end of the day. And several hours later, the vineyard owner returns to the marketplace and finds others who are still looking for work, as Jeff has read. He hires them and tells them that he'll pay them what he says, what is fair for their labours. He repeats this throughout the day until his final trip to the marketplace at 5 o'clock when he hires the final group of workers for the vineyard, who are not actually working all that long, because about six o'clock, the end of the workday comes, the vineyard owner pays the workers, and the ones who had been hired last are paid £60 each. So, of course, those workers who have been hard at work since the early morning are getting pretty impressed with this, with this generosity, and start to get a bit excited. Well, if he's giving for £60 to the latecomers, surely those of us who worked all day long, hey, hey I wonder what we're going to get. So then the vineyard owner pays those who have worked for part of the day, £60 each. Those who have been working since 6 o'clock get a little anxious. Then it's time for them to get paid and they receive the same £60, a denarius, as anyone else. And they're indignant. Where's the fairness? You know, I've borne the brunt of the sun of the day and done it all through. And what's the vineyarder's response? Well, he tells the workers that he's generous in his giving that he rewards all who work for him equally and that they should appreciate what they have been given rather than be envious that others were given the same. The parable doesn't tell us if those who worked all day ended up agreeing with the vineyard owner or whether they carried on grumbling. But by earthly standards, some people say, well, hang on, they've got a point, haven't they? It's a little bit unfair, isn't it? This particular parable, though, is described by Jesus as a way to understand the kingdom of heaven. It's hard to imagine how we could compare the ordeal people go through each day at those temporary service agencies with the glory of the kingdom of heaven. So, what's the difference? Well, the answer is the boss. Whereby day labourers in Chicago often have employers who seek to take advantage of them, the vineyard workers are working for a vineyard owner who loves them and cares for them and provides for them. Jesus clearly places himself in the parable as the vineyard owner, describing all people as potential workers in the vineyard and the denarius as the gift of salvation given by God. So what does all this mean? Well, whether we become a Christian as a child and serve God faithfully for decades or become a Christian in our our old age and serve him only for a few days before dying, the reward of our salvation is exactly the same. Because as the the parable makes clear, it's not the quality of our work in the vineyard or the length of time that earns us the denarius, if you like, of our salvation, but all who make the choice to accept God's invitation in the marketplace, to come and serve in his vineyard, and to accept the love and provision of the vineyard owner, will receive the same gift of salvation equally. Now, if somebody comes to the Lord, all right, let's just take it almost to the extreme, on their deathbed, are we happy and pleased? Or do we turn around and say, well, you know, okay, that person's got salvation, but hang on, I've been serving him for decades. You know, 
It doesn't make any difference. We don't think like that, do we? Our salvation is exactly the same as the person who's come at the last minute. In that sense, it doesn't make any difference. But how can we banish all thoughts completely as to whether there will be a doubt or not? I think the first thing is, we're meant to know. God wants us to know. He doesn't want us to wonder and fret about our salvation. Scripture helps us to answer this question so that we can be sure of life's most important question. Where is our eternal destiny going to be? Scripture tells us that we are meant to know for sure whether or not we have salvation. We don't just have to hope so or wonder if we will get to heaven someday. Some people say, well, you know, I sort of hope the scales will tip in my favour if I can do enough good deeds and be nice to my neighbour and do a good things in my lifetime, be a good person, pay me bills on time, be good to my family, then maybe I'll make it to heaven. I don't know. It isn't like that at all. I remember I was telling the story of when I was at school, primary school in Birmingham. Um, back in the 1950s now, we had an RE teacher. And this teacher gave something that actually struck me, although it was an untruth. He says, you know, at the end of your life, what will happen is this. All the, good, all the good things that you've done, God will put a nice big red tick there. And all the bad things that you've done, there'll be a nasty black cross there. And at the end of your life, all the ticks will be added up and all the crosses will... And providing the red ticks beat the... Uh, you're, you're in. You'll be okay. Now, yes, there is a book. There is a book of life. But that is actually not the way. The only good thing it had on me is it did concentrate my mind and introduce the subject, if you like, in a way. So, inadvertently, that particular RE teacher gave me some sort of path to go on, but he, he was actually wrong. Some of the scriptures I can tell you which prove that is that 1 John 13 says, the things that I've written unto you, says John, that you, that you believe on the name of the, the Son of God, are written so that you can know that you have eternal life and that you can believe on the name of the Son of God. And even after receiving Jesus into their lives, many people still live under a great weight of condemnation, feeling that... God will still punish them for their sins, even after they've been forgiven. What does the scripture say about that? Romans 8.1 says, Therefore there is now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Psalm 103 says, a verse there, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. In other words, the whole wide picture is such that God has actually done it. There is no need for us to fret. 1 John 9 says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful, and just to forgive us, and cleanses us from all unrighteousness. And John 5, 24, He that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from life into life from death. And God wants us to know this. We don't have to live with a vague question about our salvation, thinking that we won't know for sure until we get there. It's not like that. And faith, secondly, faith is such that we access our salvation via faith. We must learn how to use our faith, not only to initially believe for salvation, but also to continue to believe that Quote, he's able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Verse from Timothy 1. And again, 1 John 5, 14. This is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petition we desired of him. Much of our problem, friends, stems from not believing that the Lord hears us. Maybe we think he's deaf. Maybe we think he's got too much going on. Maybe he feels as though, um, yeah, I'll get round to them. At, or maybe he thinks, oh, not him again. Goodness me, he's on to me again. He's, he's already mentioned this, goodness knows how many times. It's all nonsense. It's all... God can listen, literally, and don't try and work this out because it's beyond our thinking. He can listen to a million prayers at the same time. 
and be in a position to answer each and every one. We don't have to feel something or see some stand, tangible sign taking place when we pray to him that God isn't hearing our prayer. Not at all. We don't have to feel anything for faith to work. It doesn't have to be something spectacular, a dramatic scene for God to be there. Faith is not feeling. We don't have to see a thing happen when we pray for that prayer to be effective and for it to be answered. Why? Because we walk by faith and not by sight. We don't say, okay, Lord, I've given you, I've asked something of you. Now I want to go outside and look up in the sky and I want to see a sign up there. We don't do that. They did in the first century, though, didn't they? Just thinking about it, those Jews. They wanted to sign in the sky over and above everything else. We don't need it. Faith comes first and then the sight or the feeling, if you like, may come later. There's an evangelist by the name of Harry Greenwood. He's English. And he says, believe you've got it before you get it. By that he means, believe you've got it before you understand it. We've got to re-educate ourselves to believe first. A person is either saved or they're not saved. When you're falling from 20,000 feet... The parachute is either going to open or it's not when you jump out of a plane. You're either going to live or you're going to die. All other options are eliminated. On a job application, when it asks if you're male or female, you can't answer the word yes. You're either one or the other. Despite what some of the strange things society is trying to introduce to us today, you're either one or the other. The scripture says, he who has the son has life. He who doesn't have the son of life does not have life. You either accepted Christ as your saviour or you're still rejecting him. And as Christians, we're called to endure. We have to endure, don't we? I looked in the Webster uh, dictionary for the word endure and it says, it translates like this, it explains it like this, it says, the ability to withstand hardship or tribulation. We're called to endure. Just to give you a world example, I saw the um, example the other day, or read about the example the other day, of a guy called Cliff Young. And he's an Australian, or was an Australian, in 1983. He's a, he was a 61-year-old sheep farmer with 2,000 acres of sheep. And there is a race every year. It's called an ultra marathon, and it's 570 miles long. And it takes about a week, and it actually goes from Sydney to Melbourne. And in 1983, Cliff Young turned up to run in this race, and he came in his old jeans and goodness knows what else. And everyone was taking the mickey out of him, saying, hey, you know, you're bringing him into a bit of a disrepute, aren't you? You know, old man, what makes you think that you can get to the other end? And he says, oh, I don't know, I reckon I can make it. He says, I've been running around for 40 years after sheep and all the rest of it. I think I can get there. Anyway, off, off they went and the elite runners, and there were some quite well-known runners in it, and they sort of sped away and all the rest of it. And Cliff Young, he, he's sort of shuffling along at his pace and all the rest of it. And uh, he's, he's sort of slowly going along and all the rest of it. Now, in this particular, the rules of this particular race were such that you ran for 18 hours. At least you had 18 hours to do whatever you wanted towards getting the other end. And for six hours, you slept. Well, nobody told Cliff Young about this. And eventually, when he got to the place where everyone else was sleeping, he didn't know anything about it. So he just carried on. And I guess he had to stop here and there for a bit of something to eat and... Um, a bit of a catnap and so on and so forth, but he, he didn't take advantage of the grant of six hours sleep. He just kept going and he kept shuffling on and all the rest of it. And he wasn't particularly concerned, he didn't see anybody, he said, oh, they're long gone. They're, they're well in the, uh, in the front and all the rest of it, but uh, I'm just going to get there. I'm just going to get there. So he just kept going. Well, he kept going for all this time, and eventually he shuffled into Melbourne. And he got there and all the rest of it, and... Uh, he was wondering where everyone was, was and people came out. And uh, he said, you've done it, well done, that's absolutely terrific. You've won the race. You what? What do you mean I've won the race? Everybody else must be here. But apparently, not only did he got there first, but he was nine and a half hours ahead of the person who came second. 
over a period of five or six days. He endured. He kept on. He kept moving forward. And sometimes in our lives, in our spiritual life, we need to do that. We need to keep shuffling on all the time. We have a glorious ending when we endure. John says there are four characteristics that will mark the life of a saved person. Answered prayer. Those who are children of God, this is one of the man's of prayer, those who are children of God spend time with him, finding out what his will is, and then as obedient children, they begin to act, and act according to that will. When you think about it, it's a very strange situation if you've got a child in your house and the child just won't talk to the parent. There must be something pretty wrong, isn't there? Something is wrong. This isn't much of a relationship. Well, so it is with us, with the Lord, if we don't talk to him. How weird. In the same way, prayer and resultant answers become a natural part of a believer's experience. Secondly, of four, we care for others. Usually in the church we can, you know, have opinions about people, can't we? And really, the Bible says that we should pray for them. They might be forget pray for them. A lady approached a, a well-known pastor of a large church in a supermarket and wagged her finger at him and said, I left your church. Do you want to know why I left your church? And he says, well, madam, I, I don't even know you. We've got 5,000 people at our church. This must have been somewhere in America, I guess. We've got 5,000 people at our church every week. And she says, I left your church because you, Mr. Pastor, weren't meeting my needs. And he replied, I, I'm sorry, I, I don't ever recall talking to you, much less discussing your needs with you. Did you ever tell any, anyone specifically what your needs are? And apparently she didn't. So he asked another question. He says, if all the 5,000 people in our church have this attitude, who is going to meet all the needs? And she stood her ground and says, well, you tell me. He says, well, lady, this is, this is what will work. When people in the pews stop saying they're not meeting my needs and start saying whose needs can I meet, then needs will be met and the servant spirit will flourish. Thirdly, decreasing influence of sin. We're not sinless by any stretch of one's imagination. And just because we can be sure of our salvation doesn't mean to say that we are still not sinning, although the Christian, I'm going to be blunt about it, does sin less. That is the overcoming that um, verse 4 and 5 speak about. The Christian is somebody who is so uncomfortable with his sin, despising in it, in it so much that he fights and eventually wins out against the dominance of sin in his life. He is the one who triumphs. Genuine believers are embarrassed by their sin. They feel like they don't belong. A pig will go back to the mud hole because he feels at home there. A sheep gets out of a mud hole quickly and avoids the next one he sees. That's the nature of a sheep. And finally, worship. A.W. Tozer. Do you remember that guy? Maybe one or two of you know the name. A well-known um, servant of God last century. He said, we are called to an everlasting preoccupation with God. He is worthy of our worship. One of the ways that you can be reasonably assured of your salvation is your desire to worship. Knowing the true God and recognizing idols that would take his rightful place are marks of a true Christian. Believers recognize counterfeits. It's like the man who wanted to get rid of his house of mice. So he bought a mouse trap, but he didn't have any cheese. So he cut out a piece of cheese, loaded up the trap, a picture of a piece of cheese, loaded up the trap and went to bed. And in the morning, there was a picture of a mouse in the trap. <laughs> a little bit like the young boy who was talking to his pastor, and the pastor says, does the devil ever tell you that you're not saved? And the boy says, yep. And he says, well, what do you say to him? He says, I just tell him it's none of his business. None of his business at all. So to all of us, I just say, let's just keep shuffling. Let's just keep moving on. Let's just keep going onwards, little by little. Get there in the end. We can be sure that at the end of the road, it will be all okay with us. And I've quoted this before, but I'll say those words because I think there's a lot of spiritualness in it. Of the championship football team, who I'm not going to name because I don't want to be talking about football after the service. And their anthem goes like this. Keep right on to the end of the road. Keep right on to the end. 
Though the way be long, let your heart be strong. Keep right on round the bend. Though you're tired and weary, still carry on till you come to your happy abode. Then all you love and be dreaming of will be there at the end of the road. Amen.